Shall we start? Subhu, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. So, good evening, uh, participants, and a very good morning, Raja and uh, Subhu. And uh, welcome to the third day of our second international uh, webinar. And uh, today we have a wonderful uh, speaker who went to talk about uh, futuristic technologies and how can you be an early bird? That's really interesting uh, topic, uh, Subhu. And uh, Subhu, um, uh, actually, uh, he is presently a senior Lean Six Sigma specialist at University of Texas. And um, uh, Subhu actually uh, grew up in Chennai, India, graduated from Anamalai University with a bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering. And uh, he moved to USA to complete his master's in computer science at Mississippi State University and Master's in Industrial Management and MBA in Healthcare Administration from Pennsylvania University. And uh, Subbu worked at Siemens USA as Six Sigma Black Belt for eight years in the Energy, Medical Equipment and Supply Chain Divisions and uh, transitioned to a Hospital Process Improvement in 2009. Since 2009, he worked for four hospital systems as Management Engineer. And currently, he's a senior Lean Six Sigma specialist at University of Texas Southwestern Health System in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Subo is a continuous uh, improvement facilitator, Lean leader, Six Sigma black belt and project manager. And with 20 plus years of progressive leadership experience in managing complex strategic projects using CI tools and methods to reduce or remove waste and process variation resulting in increased staff and patient customer satisfaction. And uh, he is also a, a skilled A3 Six Sigma Lean facilitator with hands-on knowledge to increase top and bottom line effectiveness and efficiency across multiple functional areas. So here you go, uh, Subhu. Uh uh, thank you, Vishal. That was uh, an excellent. Uh, I need that presentation when you can you send it to me. I can use <laughs> <Definitely>. it. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, so Usha and I went to Anamalai. So I, I have uh, very good memories of that. So we uh, were the same batch, and I'm really fortunate. Dr. Usha has uh, um, asked me to present um, about futuristic technologies to you all. I, I want this to be. Uh, uh, discussion mostly. Uh, I'm going to present some stuff, but I want this to be a uh, discussion mostly so that it's uh, uh, I, I want to start some um, thinking process and I'm happy to uh, work with you all in the future as well. But uh, this is just a spark I'm trying to ignite. Um, my motivation is many things, but the one motivation is uh, I'm always, uh, um, I shouldn't say concerned, but um, as somebody who grew up in India, I've been asking this question every day. Uh, how come we have uh, the best software engineers in the world, but uh, everybody comes to the US and uh, they are leaders in uh, uh, software companies like uh, Google is led by Sundar Pichai, Microsoft is led by Satya Nadala, and uh, I can go on and go on. But uh, we haven't been able to uh, do uh, similar things in India. We just are being the uh, resource of the world. How can we turn it around? We definitely can do that. Uh, and uh, this time, the um, the younger generation is the prime to do that. So I just want to work with you all to take that opportunity. With that being said, uh, let me share my screen. So can you all see my presentation? Yeah. Okay, good. You so, need to go um, to the presentation mode, Subbu. Okay, we'll do. So what what is uh, futuristic technology and how can you be an early bird? So that, that is what um, we're going to talk about in the next uh, hour or so. Um, like I said, um, futuristic technologies can be many things to many people, but uh, I want to... Um, go beyond technologies here uh, because I believe uh, futurism is not just technology, it's other things as uh, I will share. And uh, so the next thing is um, I, I want lots of people to participate. So 
uh, the next thing is I'm going to ask you guys a question. So this is a poll question and uh, you, you don't need to um, call out. You can respond in the chat box. How do you all spend most of your free time during this pandemic? So think about it. Most of us or everybody, uh, literally everybody is at home nowadays. So um, in addition to work, how do you spend most of your free time during this pandemic? If it was not for the pandemic, you would go out, meet friends, go to restaurants, uh, go to movies or uh, shows and all that. But uh, right now, what are you doing? How do you spend most of your free time? If you can type that in the chat box, uh, that would be great. So I'll give uh, maybe one minute for that. Usha, you can tell me whether we are seeing any responses. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm just checking with the chat box. I request all the participants to please type in the chat box. So he's asking, other than your work hours, what do you do? Yeah, outside of work, what do you do? How do you spend your free time? Whether it's, um, you know, for example, I spend my time with my little daughter, my second daughter, we play, you know, we play cards, uh, we play chess, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, most of them are enjoying with their family, uh, mm. play with their kids, and uh, Raja, hiking. Good. You have to keep healthy. Yeah. Thank you, Raja, for joining today. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to move to the next slide, but you, you guys can uh, still answer that as you get a chance. So like uh, Dr. Usha said, um, my um, I started working for hospitals or healthcare 10 years ago. Um, before uh, before that, if you told somebody you're an engineer and you work for a hospital, uh, they would be surprised. Um, they would ask you really because most of the things uh, is they would either expect a nurse or a doctor or somebody uh, connected with healthcare. But um, today they will not, especially in uh, USA. The healthcare system is highly complicated here. It's very complex, and even for a healthcare professional, it can be confusing. Um, USA spends close to 17% or nearly one fifth of their GDP or $3.6 trillion, uh, nearly $11,000 per person per year on healthcare. It is the highest healthcare spend for any country. However, results are uh, highly varied. So I'm passionate about healthcare process improvement and my priorities are one, family and friends to healthcare process improvement and three, volunteering. My uh, the main focus of my work is to leverage technology and resources to improve patient outcomes. The key for me is to understand the intersection between technology and people and to create seamless workflows. So here um, you see a chart of the um, GDP of India in 2018, it's $2.71 trillion. So US spends more than the GDP of India, the whole country of India, just on healthcare, just on one uh, spend, they spend that. Um, so that is something to think about. So what does futuristic mean to you? Again, this is a poll question. So I want you all to type up what does futuristic mean to you when uh, Dr. Usha sent you this uh, presentation or this uh, upcoming seminar, what do you all think about futuristic? Just in one or two words, if you can type up what does futuristic mean to you, that would really help us to understand what the audience is thinking. And again, use the chat box if you can and uh, tell us what does futuristic mean to you? So I'll give you guys some time here again.
Okay. So if you Google futuristic, these are the things you will get. Having or involving very modern technology or design. And then there is also futurism. But if you ask people what futuristic would mean, they, they tell it's a high tech, innovative, advanced, cutting edge, revolutionary, ahead of its time, pioneering, visionary, right? So it so here it's not just technology. It could be a person. A person could be visionary. A person could be revolutionary. He could be he or she could be pioneering. Some of the things um, you guys are doing right now, those are pioneering, right? Reaching out across the world to advance your skill sets and um, learn about things. That is pioneering. That is something that is uh, innovative and uh, new. What is futuristic approach? These are people who are special interest in a science or futurology to systematically explore and predict what the future holds for mankind or for the earth. So if you, again, if you look at futuristic examples or uh, Nicholas tells, uh, Tesla is a great example. So without uh, Tesla, I'm not sure whether we would have this much advancement today or, or somebody should have had in, invented alternating current for electricity. So without electricity, where would we be? So today, um, somebody with his last name as their first name, Mr. Musk, he is being, or uh, he's at least being at the cutting edge of so many things here. The Tesla cars, and uh, he's got his own space vehicles sending you to Mars and all that. So uh, that's an example of somebody who, who was ahead of his time. Similarly, if you look at uh, in India, we can talk about it also. There have been so many people who have been pioneering in, in their field, in so many different fields. Uh, I grew up in Chennai and my neighbor was uh, K. Balachandar. Um, if you look at, uh, if you've seen some of his movies, they were uh, revolutionary at the time. He was talking about women's lib and all those things. So people are uh, done innovative things in different areas. So this is the colossal computer from 1943. So that was uh, nearly 80 years ago. So can you believe uh, the size of the computer today? Yesterday, Raja showed us a chip in the finger, you know, small chip that could do magic, right? So the size of the computer, computing power has increased while the size of the computer has started to become smaller and smaller and smaller. We all have so many computers in our hand and everything today, our iPhones, all the devices, even watches and all that. So size is becoming a key factor in technology. This is called the hype cycle. And this is an interesting uh, way to look at uh, growth of technology. If you start from the left, anything starts with the research and development. The uh, presentation Raja did yesterday was very timely. If you look at how he was presenting his development of IoT device, the design and all that, what were the customer requirements and the ring he was presenting, that would be the R&D phase. Then once you are able to develop the minimum viable product, then you start getting some investors, venture capital funding, and then you go to the first generation of the product then you get somebody, some people to test it, the first movers or early adopters. You have some marketing and there's mass media hype. Then you have suppliers and uh, the maturity starts. After the maturity and early adopters is done, then this is typical of any product or technology unless you keep changing it. So it starts to wane due to various things. And then unless you intervene and have a second generation of products, it will start to decline and uh, 
that's the end of the product. Otherwise, you have to keep reinventing your product itself to keep growing. So if you look at the iPhones, that's one reason, uh, popular example, every three years or every two years, they come out with new features, new, new models. So the user, you know, invariably has to spend more money and get the latest version as long as they want to be current. So that is the primary model of technology. They, they want you to adapt to the newer thinking, newer functionality based on what has been developed, based on some of the needs, some of the requirements and all that. So that keeps on going, that cycle. So that innovation cycle should never stop. Otherwise your product will die. So that's the hype cycle. So that's also called disruptive innovation. One person you may want to Google in this is Clayton Christensen. Um, he was the Harvard uh, Business School professor. He's the one who brought up disruptive innovation. And he was a consultant to big organizations like Intel and all that. So Netflix is a great example of disruptive innovation. Earlier, you used to rent, in India, for example, you used to go to your local store and rent videos and all that. Similarly, in the US, we had Blockbuster, the local store where we can go get our DVDs for rent, um, watch them for a couple of days, uh, you know, to keep them for a couple of days and then return it. But then Netflix came in and now it's a different model. You don't need DVDs or anything. They just stream the whatever you want, whenever you want to your home in any device and Blockbuster went out of business. So what happened here was Blockbuster stopped right here and they, they did not know what to do with their uh, offering. They did not know the market was changing. The customer needs were changing. Internet had created so many opportunities. So, so that is a classic example. So in terms of futuristic itself, it's actually a program in some universities, the pre premier being University of Houston here in Texas. Um, it's called a foresight now. And uh, that is one thing that uh, they focus on creating futuristic thinkers. Now let's dive into some examples of organizations that are doing futuristic work. Intel is a classic company that reinvents its chips every so often from either uh, uh, Pentium, Celeron or all those chips. So they have started to, uh, like the embedding Raja was talking about, they have started to customize chips specific for industries. This one is for the financial sector, for banking and all that. And it gives you an overview of where they are going or where some of this is already there. But um, also this is the baseline for what some of this that is happening or going to happen whether it's uh, your mobile payments, Paytm or Google Pay or retail, you walk in and uh, all your credit card information is stored on your iPhone or whatever, and you don't even have to pay for it. Amazon has stores in the US where you can walk in, pick up whatever you want and you walk out and, and they already know who you are, how many, you pick, how many items you picked up, what you picked up, and your credit card is already built. Similarly, wearables, we're going to talk about wearables a lot because that is where some of the greatest innovations are off or happening. So the next question I have for you all is uh, pretty uh, interesting. If you can type this up in the chat, that'll be great too. What is your favorite app on your mobile phone today? What is your favorite app that you use on the mobile phone today? So, Bo, can we have a single slide instead of uh, having the next slide too? Because it's too small and able to. Oh, you're seeing this screen. Okay, I got it. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you see the big screen? Perfect. Okay, thank you. 
So I didn't even, okay, God, thank you. So what is your favorite app on your mobile phone today? Shah, are we getting any responses? Yes, yes, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, mm. Zoom, Zoom, Arogya Setu. Mm, Arogya Setu, good. <laughs> mm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, interesting. Raja says email. Email, yeah. And nobody uh, told about Facebook. It's good. Nice to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but WhatsApp and Facebook are, uh, yeah. We can't live without WhatsApp, I guess, nowadays. Yeah. Okay, good. So keep moving here. Um, so this is the growth of the US economy um, from 1800 to 2018. As you can see, US was primarily an agriculture economy starting in 1800. So I, uh, when I came to the US, uh, the, one of the first st states we were living in was Pennsylvania. And uh, we went to the state house, it's like the capital in Harrisburg, and we were taking a tour. And after the tour, um, the tour guide had a question for everybody. He asked, what is the primary um, industry of um, Pennsylvania? So everybody was saying, uh, manufacturing, technology, and all that. But he said, no, agriculture. So that was 10, maybe uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Big state in uh, US, the primary economy was dr driver was agriculture. So, but today all over the US, if you look at this, 80% of the economy is driven by service. While uh, less than, I would say less than 5% or even five is agriculture and a small portion is manufacturing, goods are manufacturing. So it's primarily a service economy and that's been the primary uh, focus for the past uh, 20, 30, maybe more than that years. Uh, actually 1950s, if you ask me, you can see the chart there. So that is because they want to develop the research and development they want to be highly technology savvy and be the technology background rather than uh, uh, creating products and all that. But with this pandemic, uh, that is proven to be uh, somewhat um, um, a disadvantage because of the reliance of supply chains of uh, outside of the US. For example, even PPE, uh, greater than 75% of PPE requirements pre-pandemic was coming from outside the US, whether it's masks, gloves, and all that. So um, that is something to think about. So um, the next question um, I want you all to think about is what is the same GDP distribution in India for agriculture, industry, and services? So you can all type in three numbers in the chat box, one for agriculture, one for industry and services. What would you estimate is the GDP distribution for India, for agri uh, in, um, agriculture, industry and services? So as I said, in the US, it's 80% uh, right now for services, uh, goods is around 15, and agriculture is around five. What would that be for India today? Sure, what are you seeing? 80, 80, 50, 50. Mm. Okay, I'll give a few more seconds for others to think and type.
Okay, so this is the distribution for India today. So it's not much different from US, at least in the trend, but uh, services has definitely increased and this should not be any surprise to anybody. Starting in 1990s, uh, when Manmohan Singh and uh, Congress started to open up and uh, we all became the outsourcing capital of the world, the services has uh, tremendously um, it's around 60% today. And uh, manufacturing is around 30 or 27, and agriculture is 14. So this is something to think about. With 1.3 billion people, uh, we have lots of people to feed and provide, meet their needs. So how is this impacting our economy? How is this impacting the long run, providing ability to um, feed people and also export agricultural crops or uh, wheat, rice and all that. How does it impact? It's something to think about. So this is where futuristic technologies comes in. How can technology help us? For In the US, even though just 5% of the GDP is from agriculture, they um, export a lot of soya and uh, pork and farming products to um, China and other parts of the world. So th that, that was possible because of technology and automation. So think around that. So this is just the gradual progression of uh, the revolution, industrial revolution from steam engine to production line or mass production with the uh, example being cars and then automated um, industry where less reliance on people with robots and all that. And now with the IoT cyber physical system, uh, with IoT and uh, Industry 4.0, Raja talked about that one, and digital twin, they're talking about digital twin now, where every design, um, there is an equivalent digital twin. For example, if you take PPE, one of the issues that we faced during the pandemic was how to mass produce in a short time frame for a demand that is um, increasing rapidly. So uh, people had to come up with ventilator designs. People had to come up with N95 mask designs and all the various companies had to come up overnight. If we had a digital twin of all these designs somewhere located, uh, either in uh, um, some the cloud or somewhere locally, and many people had access to the design, how would that be using 3D printers if everybody was able to do that? That is what is happening today. There was a seminar with the Siemens CEO the other day, in, uh, and she was talking about how in Atlanta, Georgia Tech students and the Siemens local Atlanta office, they started using 3D printers and started make, making masks and gloves and all that. But they had to develop the design first. So that was the uh, lead time was being added to that. So time became crucial to do that. So that is something to think about. So these are some examples of futuristic technologies that were too early for that time. Uh, but now they are coming back in different shape or form because of the rapid growth of uh, CPU and chip devices that are smaller, not bulkier, and with faster uh, uh, computing speed and capabilities. Um, so that's what is happening. For example, the Seco RISP PC back in 1981, that didn't take off, it was not exactly a smash hit. Similarly, a space attacker watch in 1984, and then the private eye 1989. But today you have the Google Glass, you have the Apple Watch, which can do email, which can do so many other things, uh, which can communicate, and then there is uh, other uh, things coming up. Bro. So these were technologies that were based on the right idea, but because the hardware had not caught up with the idea, 
they were not physically um, able to meet the demands in a very easy manner. So they didn't take off. So it's not just having the right idea, but also having the right hardware to combine with it. And timing always is going to be important. So uh, this is a slide with uh, too much um, content on it, but I'm just going to give you guys the highlight. So when I talked about wearable technology, this is where the future is. But back in uh, 700 years or whatever, with the um, there was uh, this um, glasses. So they were using these glasses. And then uh, even in Rome, there was this emperor who was using polished emeralds to watch and see better his gladiator fights and all that. So lenses were already there. So some of the things we do right now, wearables with the glasses, were uh, pretty um, significantly available long time ago. Whether they were being used by everybody like now, that's not the case, but uh, definitely that existed to some extent. So humans have always been uh, trying to come up with innovative ideas, but to lack of advancement in uh, hardware or uh, of other attributes, physics or something else, they did not make the change. Similarly, Apple, um, like Dr. Um, like uh, Raja was talking about the ring, they have a patent on a ring commute computing device, and they are talking about uh, something similar that the ring in your finger. Uh, can't um, talk to Siri or um, touch screen, communicate with um, with whoever you want, similar to the Apple Watch. But uh, incidentally, that's similar to uh, the Abacus ring that was developed in the Ing Dynasty back in 1644. It was called the Abacus ring. And then there's this, uh, re we have these cameras now, you know, we have these iPhone cameras where uh, people take uh, videos and pictures and they become viral and all that. But in 1907, during the war time, pigeons were used with cameras so they can go behind enemy lines and take pictures and return back. So that was used for spying and all that. Some of the biggest inventions and innovations have come out of war situations or extreme situations like the pandemic we are in. The Trojan horse is an example of that, how the Romans sent the Trojan horse inside and um, how that was done. So, so um, creativity has been enhanced in situations we are in now, and we, we are seeing it even today. So what are some of the, um, futuristic technologies that are being worked on that we can expect in the next five, 10, or even 15 years, or even some of them are already here. Uh, Self-driving cars, for example, it's already here in many cities. Um, it's uh, being commercial, mostly com they're expecting to go commercial by uh, next year or maybe afterwards. Maybe the pandemic is delaying some of the rollout, but uh, maybe not. But definitely that is already here, driverless cars. Then drones that are being used for various type of transportation, whether delivery, uh, surveillance, defense, healthcare. Um, healthcare is a great example. So drones are being used to um, transport critical, uh, not just equipment, but also uh, human needs, a uh, blood, um, you know, if, if a patient is in, uh, involved, I'm sorry, if uh, somebody is involved in an accident in the middle of the road, uh, imagine this. So we all know when Princess Diana passed away in France, Paris. So imagine if we had some of these technologies. Um, that is one thing they keep saying, right? So she could have been saved if we had some of the technologies available or even uh, they had a better system in the subway wherever she got uh, accident was involved. So healthcare is one area where drones are being used a lot to transport, um, whether it might be um, somebody who needs a bypass surgery or a replacement lung or a heart or a kidney. So how can that be delivered in a fast manner from one place to the other, from one hospital to the other? Then there are trains 
uh, hyperloop trains uh, they ta- they are talking about 600 miles per hour for cargo which is faster than some uh, some of the flights we are in today so 600 miles per hour uh, would be uh, imagine uh, in the us you can travel from seattle which is in the west coast northwest to atlanta which is in the um, southeast within um, less than um, probably 3 4 hours which would cut short um, most of the travel time now and cargo you can uh, deliver cargo faster and then there is alexa siri and all that they are growing in terms of the ai functionality um they pretty much know what what your buying habits are they pretty much know all the answers i was asking you guys they know that you're using whatsapp they know you're using instagram you're using zoom so based on that they can cater the marketing uh, what kind of products you're looking for what kinds of um, so targeted marketing can be done and uh, also it can be helpful uh, to businesses in so many ways and then there's space travel which is uh, going to be interesting in the next few maybe 5 years um there is um elon musk who's big on that then there's virgin uh, dr branson and then there is um amazon's uh, jeff bezos these three are big and then there is also uh, other private companies prosthetics is one area where i'm highly excited about um futuristic technology will help people who have either lost their limbs or legs due to and um, natural or uh, accidents so this will uh, bring them back to full uh, uh, potential back to their uh, things and all that i was reading the other day there's a uh, somebody in india who plays uh, badminton or uh, who's got her um, who's a champion who's a national champion who's got her lost limbs replaced by prosthetics and that came through whatsapp so these are all things that are happening what is the gap today in terms of prosthetics the gaps is um, the compatibility with the brain it's more a physical attribute now how can the um, how can that be connected to the brain that's what they are working on and then even clothes are changing uh, even the clothes are becoming more uh, heat resistant for fireman jackets improving strength and durability and there are some devices in the clothes that can uh, help you with your uh, um vital signs whether you're having a um, and also give some of the metrics needed if you're a performer on the field whether you are in sports or um, any other um, whether movies and all that so those things are being done how the metrics can be added to how you are performing and then there is education with the virtual reality uh, this is something uh, that uses uh, google glass or um, any other type of device that you can sit at home and pretty much um, teach anybody about uh, future history or or uh, i'm sorry history and geography and uh, take them to any museum or any part of the world these are driven by um, nanotechnology or by um, all the advancements in chip computing that uh, rajesh was talking about and the last thing and this is not a comprehensive list there is so many other things coming up so as the risk gauntlet this is an interesting thing this is a next phase of advancement in wearables where um, the risk gauntlet provides everything you might need in terms of uh, uh, functionality and uh, it's it will be your next uh, iphone but without a phone on your uh, hand itself you're going to be you don't need a pocket for this anymore you're just going to wear it so um let me try to play this device autonomous delivery never seen a robot like this it has to be the first time what is this thing 
My first reaction when I saw the robot, I said, what? You're gonna do what? You're gonna do how? Okay. Rather than spending time in line waiting for food or coffee, or having to stay nearby to the cafeteria, our technology allows employees more freedom to spend time how they want, where they want. Whether it's having a late lunch at your desk during a busy day, or going outside and enjoying a snack with colleagues, our robots can help. So what we're doing is, we're using robots to autonomously deliver food, drinks, and snacks to customers. We're enabling everyone to order food directly to their building or anywhere they want outside. Beyond the convenience of having food delivered, we aim to save people time. So how does it work? A campus employee or visitor will go to starshipdeliveries.com, download the app on your mobile device, and you're in there. That's it, start ordering food today. They open the app, and they're presented with many options that are available from the local cafeteria. You can get a burger, you can get a Philly cheesesteak, you can get popcorn, you can get whatever you want. They drop a pin on the map, and that pin represents where they're gonna meet the robot. They finalize payment, and then they go to a screen that says how long it'll take till the robot arrives. Typically, this is 15 minutes or less. The kitchen receives a notification that a customer has just placed an order through the Starship app. When we get an order, we stop what we're doing, we make that order first, get it out quick as we can. While the kitchen is preparing the meal, the robot starts to travel from either its most recent meeting point or from a staging area to the kitchen itself. The kitchen then places the meal in the robot and then dispatches it to the customer. The customer will receive a notification that says your robot's en route. The robot uses the most efficient and quickest method to drive autonomously to the customer. The customer then receive another notification when the robot has arrived at the meeting point. The customer is then notified to come down and meet the robot. They'll be able to then unlock the robot and take their food. So the small little cute robot delivered my lunch today. I just love getting my food out to the masses. This is a different, better way to do it. I would absolutely use this service again. Probably tomorrow. So that's um, being used in lots of campuses here in the US, especially to order food, but also in lots of uh, manufacturing plants, they can deliver spare parts and all that across the plant and all that. So the um, applications are endless, especially with this COVID-19 pandemic. Imagine um, social distancing and delivery without a person being involved and, uh, and uh, getting it. So that is uh, really, uh, something that's taken off recently, but that's been there for a while. So um, I want you all to think about this as we are going through this. Are we missing out on the low hanging fruit and how can we be the early bird, especially in India? Uh, healthcare wearables, just in time supply chain and COVID-19 impact. How can we improve customization or multiple applications for similar products? For example, face masks became a big uh, a supply chain issue. We were not getting space masks in the hospital. So we started using construction face masks. But there's a difference between construction face masks and uh, healthcare face masks. They're not approved by uh, the uh, authorities or uh, compliant with the FDA and all that. But how can we make these products uh, easily customizable? Uh, that is one thing to think about. Even supply chain, uh, with just in time supply chain, um, inventory is low and low. So we all depend on uh, buying when we need, when uh, wherever we need it. But that was not the case in pandemic. We wanted more and more of the, uh, more than the expected needs of the PPE. So what can supply chain do? And then especially technology for me today, especially for India, should meet the needs of the people rather than the wants. So basic healthcare, basic food, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know uh, affordable home building, affordable healthcare, affordable food, uh, good quality affordable food. Uh, we can all go to the other wants of having cars and TVs and all that technology. 
do we really need uh, driverless cars in India right now? Maybe some part of India may need it, but not everybody. So think around that. And if you ask me, nonviolence or satyagraha was futuristic because Gandhiji is known everywhere in the world today, not because of uh, anything else, but because of his ideas of nonviolence and satyagraha. That was, he brought it up because he knew that that, that was the only way to send the message, not to just Indians, but across the world of getting freedom from the British. We could not have done it with the violence and fighting and all that. So he knew that. So he you have to think differently. And you have to think outside the box. And that is why um, I think even today there is a, a statue of uh, Gandhi everywhere uh, in, uh, in any country in the world. And then market size for a for a size of India, you know, why haven't we created? You know, we have 200 Chinese apps in India, while we have the largest pool of software engineers. Why? So these are, we don't have any answers today, but I'm just asking these rhetorical questions because I'm sure um, this is something we have to answer as we move forward. So in the interest of time, um, I'm not going to play this video now, but uh, if we can come back and do that later, that'll be fine. And then there is wearable technology through lenses, fitness trackers, smart watches, smart clothing, or so-called fashion tech devices. In fact, uh, wearable tech is encompassing embedded sensors, smart tattoos, and um, virtual reality and, uh, and all that is happening. So these are again the firemen that I was talking about in terms of what devices they have. These sensors will give them the uh, temperature, the chemical exposure, and it's a communication module with the microprocessor that they have. So people outside know uh, if they need any help or what's going on inside and they can track whether this person is in danger inside. So somebody from outside. Similarly for, uh, these are some of the wearables and what times they came out, starting from uh, the business microscope from Hitachi, the polar rate monitor, the mindset EEG, um, so most of this is around uh, healthcare settings. I just briefly mentioned this. So Cam Newton is a soccer or football player here in the US, right? So 2011, they developed special devices that he can wear. So when he's running or when he's uh, in the field, they can easily uh, track what kind of things he's doing. So how fast he is, uh, how, um, what is his agility and all that. So this is called physiolytics. Physio and this is the study of human uh, performance in any kind of setting. And uh, again, um, wearables are making a big impact in this. So I want to run this video. This is the latest device that Sony has come out with. It came out, I think, maybe last week. Um, so this is the Sony device. This is about the Walkman here. Um, so Walkman, we know that it revolutionized uh, music, listening to music. But uh, this on the right side, this is an air conditioner that you can have on your shirt.
so as you can see this is a pocket air conditioner that you just have to insert in your shirt and um, it's also a he you know it can warm and cool both depending on the temperature and uh, weather conditions so this is the next um this is recently introduced just maybe last week and it can accompany your special t-shirt that holds the device in the middle of the back and uh, serves to cool the body So data is available everywhere. So um, with your, um, today you can Google and uh, you can see that most of uh, information is available. If you have the time and willingness and uh, energy to deep dive into any kind of thing, you can do it today. Data is pretty much open. So that, that is the advantage of the internet. But uh, how can we harness that? So as of April, 2019, Asia was home to more than one third of the world's unicorns. Unicorns are startups valued at more than 1 billion and uh, that are um, going to uh, create innovative products for the market. 91 of these companies are in China, followed by India with 13 and South Korea at six and Indonesia at four. So it's definitely changing and definitely something, the opportunity is unlimited for um, the Indian market. So I want to, um, as we are closing down, I want to share the story of Ashley Kimball. Ashley Kimball is a freshman at University of Alabama in Birmingham, uh, which would mean she's the first year student. And what she did was she downloaded prosthetic from, the, uh, from online and used 3D printers to print a prosthetic device for a military marine who had a, his hands, um, his foot, I'm sorry, built a lighter prosthetic foot wounded in Afghanistan. So this is the kind of um, advancement that is happening uh, today that we can, um, somebody like a college student is able to print using 3D printer and customize it using the digital twin from Google, from online. She, she got the design from online. So this is the last video I want to play. Yeah. Emma. Huh? Emma. Emma. So technology is great, but it can replace everything. That's just a humor. I want to finish off with some humor here. And then the last slide. So what is the role of academia and education in futuristics? So I think the role is in experimentation. The role is in um, encouraging the youngsters of today to experiment, to try. It's okay to fail. Um, it's okay to fail, but keep experimenting. Um, you know, fail uh, cheap and fail easy. Fail fast and fail easy is a big mantra here fail fast and fail easy and fail um, cheap. So I, experimentation, startups in search of a business model that works, that is the key for, um, that the key differentiator I think for in, in countries like US and Finland and those innovative countries around the world. And then it goes into once the model becomes mature and all that, then they become corporations and execute and all that. Will every experiment become execute and become corporations? No, but the more experimentation we have, that is the key to creating great corporations and great brands. With 1.3 million people, I think we can probably count the global brands that are out of India. Well, I think that is the opportunity. How can we do this? You know, education must 
start the competitive clubs and entrepreneurship programs, co-op programs, um, starting early with the students, end of first year, if you ask me, with partnership with the local industry, something like the Shark Tank. You know, in, in, in the US, Shark Tank has been a big hit starting in 2009, 11 years ago. That show has created so many entrepreneurs uh, based on the Japanese model. Uh, how can you do that? Maybe those are the things we can talk about and think about. And then with COVID-19, they are having all these hackathons, big universities, whether it's MIT, Stanford, Harvard, everyone um, is having hackathons. They are bringing ideas to the table. I've heard Dr. Usha mention about ideas. Ideas are great. We need to bring them out. Every, you know, we need to encourage kids to bring out those ideas. And how can we harness them from idea generation to something as a prototype? And from a prototype, maybe people like Raja and people like, um, you know, there are so many people around the world who are looking for ideas, who are looking for prototypes. You know, money is abundant out there everywhere in advanced countries. They want, they are looking for good ideas and good models. Yesterday, um, I don't remember the name of the gentleman. He brought up a great example the scavenger who goes underground to clean. That shouldn't happen in today's day and age. How can technology you know, help that? You know, how can that, that could be not applied to India, so many third world countries. And then I just want to add one more thing. This is a team from University of Dayton, the STAR team. They come to Orissa every year, Orissa and Bihar. And then they have developed a refrigeration for medication and vaccines. As you all know, the last mile of vaccine is critical, the cold chain. If we don't have a good cold chain, then the vaccines uh, are impacted and the efficacy is going to be impacted. So this team came to Bihar to develop a um, refrigerator using, without electricity, using um, ethanol and uh, carbon. So think around those terms. And uh, I'm happy to work with you all as we move forward. And then the last slide, I want to thank you all in different languages, but my language is Tamil. So I want to thank you all, Nandri, for this opportunity, Nandri. And uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Subhu. Yeah, the participants can ask you questions. Very good morning, sir. Uh, this is Shanmu Sundram from uh, College of Engineering, India, Nine University. I would first compliment you for uh, uh, beautifully consolidating all the technologies that are uh, available today and uh, which has the potential to be what we see today as a futuristic technology in near future would be the technology in everybody's hands. Uh, I have just two questions, probably as a uh, Tamilian, you would be appreciating necessity is the mother of every invention. Yeah. And uh, that is the reason why we can see this pandemic coming out with new, new products. And uh, probably creativity and innovation is the watch word that people, everybody uses. And with development of 5G technologies, just consolidating all the artificial intelligence, the huge data, and all those things, we would be able to come out with many, many, many innovative products. And fortunately, as you mentioned, there is so much of money and we'll be able to come out with new products. But do we compromise on the security and uh, the privacy of the individual? Because I feel any applications, as you just asked, does not allow us to use it unless we grant permissions to include all the things that are there in our private phone. So what seems to be a private data, of course, it could be for their use, but do we compromise on our security and privacy? Yeah, so, so th that's a profound question, um, Dr. Sanmoshanam, that is a profound question. And um, the answer to that, I'm going to give you a long-winded answer, but uh, forgive me for that. No, no problem, so, sure. So I was reading about something um, so you all know about Dr. Swaminathan. He was the uh, agriculture one, scientist. Yes, sir, agriculture. Yeah. So um, 
back in that period when they were trying to create uh, more food for India because of so many things, uh, he was facing the same challenge. One of the challenges he was facing was whether we should use more fertilizer because we were not using fertilizer. When, we, when, when, when they went to Punjab and all the wheat bowl, they, they realized farming was being done. Uh, they were ready for uh, automation, tractors, uh, mechanization and all that. But uh, they were not ready for chemicals. They were not ready for fertilizer. So the American scientists, when they came in, they gave this idea, they told them, this is what you got to do. You got to put this fertilizer, whatever, uh, ammonia or whatever that might be. And then they left, but they came back and they realized they did everything, but except the uh, fertilizer and the results were, uh, um, you know, they were not great. They were mediocre. They, they, they did not, um, they were not efficient as much as the expectations they had or the comparative analysis they had done. So they had to come back and be really hard on the people and uh, put pressure on Swaminathan and agriculture ministry and all that. Uh, so it was a slower pace, but finally they relented and uh, slowly they started using fertilizer and all that. And uh, the uh, wheat bowl uh, grew and grew and uh, we became an exporter of wheat versus importer of that. So the point I'm trying to make is um, anything that is going to be um, good for human beings uh, is not going to be completely free or completely. Um, so, so it goes back to my earlier thought process. The reason we have to give our uh, data, the reason we have to share everything they know about us is Facebook, Google, everybody has an ulterior motive. So we are giving you Google for free, you can search for anything, you know, this white space with this small box, you can search for anything. But we want to know who you are, where you are, what you spend, what you eat, because that is how we make money. We are going to sell your information to hundreds of companies. So that is the way capitalism works. So we have to take a step back and then we have to do the Indian way of looking at things. How can we be uh, environmentally, like environmentally friendly, how can we be rolling out technologies that are more gentle and not invasive on people's data? So that would mean that we would need pioneering in a, innovation that is uh, more, uh, you know, with the focus on uh, um, the customer, the focus on environment and all that. But that will take much more than relying on American companies or capitalism. That will take coming back to our roots, coming back to companies that are more um, based on uh, some margin of profit because companies are run by profits. Without profit, without finance, nobody can run it. Some margin of profit, but not uh, any visions of global uh, globalism. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but it's going no, no, to be no, very you... difficult. Yeah. No, it, you beautifully answered it. I, I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, the second one is, I, I could see even uh, in uh, better colleges and uh, universities, we do have that uh, uh, Center for Entrepreneurship where we try to do that. But quite unfortunate, uh, uh, not many students are inclined towards entrepreneurship. And as you rightly mentioned, in US, there are uh, 100 uh, people who come out and if even 97 fails, the three percentage makes a big difference. But how to make that happen in India? In, uh, of course, you, you would have uh, seen both the worlds of uh, the Indian as well as the uh, US. So uh, how we can try to, uh, of course, we try to motivate the students starting from the first year. And unfortunately, uh, though there are very brainy childs, uh, the unfortunately, the one that stuck to them as whether they would become successful. And uh, I can see uh, people like Dr. Usha, Ishwaran, or anybody who tries to be a kind of a gentle support, make this happen. But uh, how the model is built in US so that we would be able to probably, in other words, if not copy, try to uh, adopt it in our universities. Yeah, great question. Um, great question. I, I'm glad you asked that question. I wanted this question to be asked. 
So one of the key differences between Indian psych and the American psych is that they start very early. It's not just first year of college. So some of these entrepreneurs, I'll give you guys an example. So I have participated in uh, four or five hackathons in the past uh, three months, sitting at home, working from home. What I'm finding is there are a lot of uh, high school students. I participated in a hackathon with Stanford and there was a high school, he's in 10th grade. This guy is in 10th grade. He's uh, excellent in programming. He's got all the ideas. Uh, he doesn't have the business mindset yet, but that's where we come in. So they start very early. The American psych starts very early. The kids are, uh, um, you know, risk. They are taught to be more uh, risk prone rather than risk averse. In India, we want to be risk averse. Failure is treated very badly in India. Uh, if you if you fail, um, I'm not I'm, I'm not saying failing in education. I'm saying if you fail in an entrepreneurship, you you are treated uh, badly. You, you you know here not the case. Um, you know failure is part of uh, stepping stone. They say like it's truly the case. So so kids start early. So maybe high school is another area where we should look at. There are entrepreneurship clubs in high school here. There are places where. They teach about if you if you want to take the finance angle, they teach about they give them uh, you know like monopoly they give them uh, a fake um, funding they say everybody's got hundred thousand dollars in the high school now so go and invest they 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 create fake investor groups and tell them to pick the companies that will win so whether it's Tesla or Apple or um, Netflix so they all get to invest and at the end of the school year everybody's judged on their portfolio. So how did you pick these companies? Well, who was, uh, who made, uh, you know, who made the 100,000 into 500,000? You know, it's all uh, like a game, you know, they gamified this and they teach them this kind of thinking very early in the school year. So that comes on into college and all that. And even before that, um, you know, these guys are starting to make their own money. Like, you know, um, in India, it's different mindset. The uh, parents do the helicoptering, if you know what I mean. We all, uh, um, you know, we are hovering around our kids a lot, but um, it, it is good. I think that is needed because that is part of the success of the Indian gene. So that is definitely needed. But I think the other case is how can we encourage them very early to think outside the box to be entrepreneurs? Otherwise, we will all be future uh, service people for the whole world. We will be the technicians of the whole world. And a few uh, Satya Nadalas and few Sundar Pichas will come out, maybe 5% or 6%. But I want to change. I, I think we should all work towards changing that to be uh, the other way around. 80-20 rule, we should be 80% on this side. If that is the case, then this is, the, uh, uh, this is unbelievably, it will turn into magic. So start very early in schools, partner with schools even, local schools, maybe you guys can partner with them and start some entrepreneurship there, start some prototyping, you know, all those things very early. And, and even the risk averseness, that is something that needs to be taught and um, slowly but surely that can be done. Thank you, thank you, very beautifully said. I can see some uh, uh, exemptions like, uh, uh, Ratan Tata investing in an 18-year-old boy's company called Generic Aadhaar. So those kind yeah. of things are also happening. And I believe uh, uh, if we try to push this into the school education system, then probably, as you rightly said, we could be able to have uh, the smaller population becoming at least 50% in the future. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It was nice, Subhu. Thank you, Usha. Thank you for the opportunity. Dr. A lot of, uh, lot of uh, people uh, giving you compliments in the chat. Thank you. You Thank could you. see the chat. Can you see the chat? Uh, I'm going to try to see the chat now. You can stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So thank you all. This is good. Like I said, it's very good. Good. It's nice.
can we all uh, have a virtual photograph can you all switch on your video Raja is ready today, so he knew very well that I'm going to ask him mm -hmm. to announce. <laughs> How was it, Raja? How was the session? Turn on your mic, uh, Raja. That helps, huh? <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Uh, future is here. That's what Subhu uh, brought us today. Thank you, Raja. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you, Raja, for waking up early and uh, attending this session. I'm really, really I, happy I, I to love, see you. I love what you're doing, actually. This is great. I'm uh, listening to all different perspectives. Um, uh, and you you have a very nice lineup of uh, speakers. So uh, it's great. It's great to be here. Uh, Subo, it was uh, the same person, uh, Professor Shanmuga Sundaram, who uh, spoke about the scavenger uh, project to Raja yes, today. Yes, yes. Yeah, he was the same person. He's from Anna University. He's an active participant in all our webinars. And, nice, nice. Uh, yeah, very happy and uh, I feel very happy and honored to have him in our uh, session always. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, can we all uh, have the uh, picture? Can you all uh, turn on your video? Smile, please. Okay, others have not turned on the video. Uh, did I turn off anybody, any one of your video in the beginning? Do you have any problem turning on your video now? Any one of you? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Subhu. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. We'll all meet tomorrow evening. Have a good day. Uh, the, yeah. Next session. Thank you so much.